emergency is really, really very much a factor of nutrition. So where does this class fit into our overall curriculum? Well, you know, as I've always mentioned, that our mission is to reach and teach as many people as we can. And one of these uh, issues is this very critical nature of good nutrition. It's vitally important. There's quite a series of classes uh, that uh, we have been teaching and will be teaching, and the long list of them. When you take a look at the nutrition, I don't expect you to be able to read those, but those are the current nutrition classes that either exist or are in the process of being completed. Some of the topics that we look at, and when you look at this as a video, you can come back and read these, so I'm not going to go through them. Uh, but these are vital nutrition topics, and then we expand into some other areas, and each one of these we will be briefly uh, touching on tonight uh, so that you'll have an idea of uh, some of the things you may need to learn about, perhaps you hadn't thought about in this area of nutrition. Preparedness, and when we talk about preparations, it really is about becoming self-reliant. And it's not just about buying a bunch of stuff and having things, because what you know, what's inside of your head, your heart, is far more important than the things that you may have stored away. It is about developing self-reliance. That is what this is all about, is self-reliance. And you will either make provisions for the future, or you will become a victim. And since each one of us has a choice in this, I just simply say, well, choose one. Each one of us should make that choice. Uh, provident living must be based on principles. And that really is the key. And that's why I like to take an approach of teaching you how and why things work rather than just here's a list of stuff. And many of you have seen these before, these uh, eight laws. And there's more than this, but these are some of the fundamental laws I talk about. We don't spend a lot of time in these classes because they're published elsewhere. Law of Providence Living being the very foundational one to this whole area, spiritual attitude, knowledge, and then stuff. And it has to be in that order of priority. The law of stewardship. It's really about the fact that we have the authority to act because we're alive. We have the responsibility to act properly within the bounds we've been granted. But the real um, bottom line to this is the accountability that will occur. And accountability will happen. It may be very positive and enjoyable, or it might be rather unpleasant and frightening. That's why it's important that we learn to act correctly, responsibly, if you will. Law of the parachute is another one of these that helps people understand why it is that uh, I believe preparedness, provident living, uh, self-reliance is all a part of life is because when things happen, you have to be prepared. And like a parachute, if you fall out of a plane, you better have it with you. You better know how to use it. It better be a good one. Well, in this case, we're talking about, in case of disasters or emergencies, it's your attitudes, your knowledge, skills, and then the supplies. Because the, the disaster doesn't care. It has no responsibility for your well-being. Whatever happens, happens. Whether it's man-caused, nature-caused, act of God, whatever you want to call it, once it has occurred, it's simply there. It is your responsibility and my responsibility to properly respond to it. These are the nine co uh, core preparedness modules. And I consider each one of them to be a parachute because you can't scratch any one of them off the list. You need them all. Well, to learn more about these important principles, uh, they are available online. There's a foundation class, which is 1001. Uh, it's free online uh, as a presentation at safeharboralliance.com. There's also the foundation video the, in the Self-Reliant series, which is called Part 1, The Foundation. That is available as a two-hour DVD through Safe Harbor Alliance, and we sell that one at a very modest price so that people can afford to get it. We'll always provide a lot of free things to people. If somebody says, look, I just have no money right now, and we understand how tough that can be, we'll do our very best to provide things like this class and others that are free on Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights. Uh, we're talking, of course, about nutrition tonight, and that's what we'll be boring into. So what is nutrition? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, it gives you some of these you know, descriptions of it about the sum process by which an animal or plant takes in and use, utilizes food substances the process by which food is assimilated and converted into energy and tissues and living organisms. Well, that's a good, you know, a scientific definition. But I want you to understand that good nutrition is not optional. Because if you fail to have good nutrition and that, during an emergency, and that doesn't make any difference whether it is because of ignorance or apathy, uh, what happens is with failed nutrition is you set the stage for loss of strength and health when you need it the most. And that's why we pay attention to it. For myself, I've identified that there are five areas for nutrition self-reliance. 
And we'll be talking about each one of these five. And this helps to set the stage for all the other classes that follow is through these five different areas. So we'll go through them. Number one, the first of the five areas is the principles of nutrition. Now, the role of nutrition in provident living is, is really, it's about just when things are tough, being able to live physically, uh, to survive, to be okay, to have health and strength, as we've talked about. And proper nutrition is important. And so food security, uh, having the ability to, uh, to provide proper nutrition in time of need is extremely important. Well, as a part of this, there are four food categories. Number one category I call expedient food. Expedient food is very, very simple. You don't have to do anything to it other than just eat it. Uh, it's something that's just ready to go. It may be in a can. You open the can, you eat it. You don't have to heat it. You don't have to mix it. You don't have to add water or anything to it. It's expedient. Those are typically wet pack foods or foods that have been prepared in such a way you can eat them. We'll look at them a little bit more. Convenience foods take a little bit of work. In most cases, we're talking about, well, perhaps a little bit of hot water, bring it to a boil, let it simmer for a couple of moments or something like that. But there's not a lot of work, not mixing and blending and all kinds of things. Uh, they're very quick and easy to get going without a lot of work. You have the long-term storage foods. Uh, these very often will be uh, whole foods, basic foods. Now we're talking, you know, rice and beans and, and herbs and dried vegetables and dried meats and things like that. Uh, they will store for long periods of time, but now you're going to have to get involved in preparing them uh, before you can, can consume them. Then another one we have is what I call future foods. These are renewable foods. This is how do you replace the foods once you have consumed them. There are what I call the true five food groups versus the uh, pyramid that you see. This makes sort of a pyramid, but we're going to give it some uh, little different understanding here. Number one, top of the pyramid at the very pinnacle of what we would call live foods. Next, there are sleeping foods. Then we have dying foods, dead foods, and finally, deadly foods. I'll come back and visit each one of those briefly in this overview area. <clears throat> you learn about these in uh, some of the, the books and the materials and videos and things. Of course, things that we teach uh, right here. But it is about learning what are the principles of nutrition. Some of the things, if you're not familiar with them, that might be a good place to start. And in other classes, when we talk to library, I'll give you the reviews on these. There's a, both a book and a DVD. The DVD is very good. It's called Food Matters. Uh, you can uh, get a consumer's uh, dictionary of food additives and see what they're all about. Some of the things that are in there are both the things that are positive and the things that are definitely not positive and good for you. Prescription for Nutritional Healing. And there's a lot of terrific books that when I do the library section, I will talk about them in greater depth. How you can learn more about these nutrition principles is in Nutrition Class 5101. That is nutrition for health and strength during disasters, and we spend the entire time just talking about these principles. Nutrition Class 5201, and that's the nutrition library that I feel that you must own. There, there's hundreds of books you could own, but I like to boil it down to, I'd say, just a, a kind of a handful of them in each one of these areas, the most important ones to own. Nutrition Class 5103, which is building health for future vitality with superfoods. Some of the things you can do right now to help build your strength and vitality. Number two area in these five uh, nutritional areas we talked about for self-reliance, that is to store foods that will promote health, health-giving foods. <clears throat> Some of them are not. Once again, the proper role of nutrition and provident living is this food security, which is a vehicle to assure that you have physical, mental strength, the, the capabilities to take care of yourself and people around you when things are tough. Well, understand the five food groups. We just briefly looked at them, so we're going to review them from worst to the best. Number one, I should say, in the list, or number five in this case, we're going to start with it, is the deadly foods. Deadly, when just the word deadly says this is something to be avoided. Uh, this is not something to be trifled with. And I will tell you that in most of what is the so-called comfort foods for most people are, in fact, deadly foods. Uh, what do they look like? Well, they look an awful lot like that. It's the snacky crackies and the highly sugared and flavored and colored and all those things. In fact, if you want to look at the rules of deadly foods, anything that has uh, the word on it like soft drink 
as opposed to a hard drink. Not that hard drinks are good, but you know, soft drinks, they're not good. We're talking the carbonated sodas and the uh, colored and flavored and sugared and those things. There's so much information on the negative benefits of those. It should be a, a no-brainer that they should be avoided. Uh, one of the other way, things I look at is if I can't pronounce what it is or I don't know what it is, some chemical name or some strange name, I'm not sure that I want to eat it. Uh, if you or someone else can't grow it, in other words, if it came out of a test tube, uh, if it came out of a processing factory that takes coal tar and turns it into colors and flavors and aromas and things like that, probably don't want it. Um, the deadly duo, and its other names or things like that, that'll shock you. Anything that we would call an artificial color, artificial flavor, or other artificial ingredients, uh, your body has to deal with them. Those are very negative and very hard on you. Number four, the dead foods. Now, dead does not necessarily mean that it's deadly. Uh, it doesn't mean that it has harmful things in it. It just means that, well, uh, the, some of these live nutrients, uh, they've been denatured or destroyed. In other words, they're dead. They've been broken down, usually because of high temperature and or uh, This is especially true of some of the enzymes and some of the other vital, very tender vitamins and phytonutrients. Uh, so these foods would be dead. Uh, they're not going to give you as much benefit, perhaps as if they were still in their live state. However, they have their advantage because this is where so many of the foods that we call the, uh, the expedient foods could be. In other words, you don't have to do anything. As long as they're not spoiled or greatly outdated or anything like that or contaminated, you can simply open them and consume them. Now, the nutritional value may not be as high as if it was a, a fresh pineapple, as in that pineapple juice, or uh, in some of the other things you'll find wet pack. Uh, that might still be, you know, the, the fruits and the vegetables and things, you'd be better off eating them alive. But uh, they don't store well alive. Some of these things don't. So this is where your expedient foods come from in the wet pack variety, uh, cooked and baked, and they will store for periods of time. So they're convenient in this regard. They're expedient, uh, but they don't have as high a nutritional value. Uh, number three, the dying foods. These are fresh foods that are aging and they may in fact be beginning to decay. The nutrient value is declining because of age, because of oxygenation, uh, because of the uh, them being consumed by bacteria that may be in the form of, well, they're eating this, this orange, this apple, this vegetable and those things and so they're consuming the nutrients rather than you. These would be dying foods and we all pretty much know what they look like. They start to shrivel and they can color and they get soft. Doesn't mean that some of these things would be harmful. As a matter of fact, those bananas that look like that, that's actually very ripe. Some people consider that uh, overripe, but they're, they would still be good. But as they continue to age and break down, the nutrient value certainly is going down. Number two, as we're getting to the top of this food pyramid in these food, pyramid in these food groups, the sleeping foods. These are viable foods. These are vital foods. They're hibernating, you can think of it. They're sleeping, but they're hibernating. They're waiting to see just the right conditions of warmth and moisture and those kinds of things so they can wake up. And the vital phytonutrients have not been destroyed by pasteurization. So what are we talking about in many cases? Well, how, how do you know that a food might be sleeping? You see those sunflower seeds, if they haven't been heated, cooked, um, and they may in fact still be live. In other words, they could sprout. Same thing might be true with almonds, although in a lot of cases some of these things have been pasteurized. Now, dried fruits, even though that fruit may not come back to life, but it has been dried at a low temperature, or uh, vegetables dried at low temperatures, many of the enzymes in there have not been broken down by the heat. They've simply had the moisture removed. When you rehydrate them, uh, many of those enzymes and phytonutrients are still available for the body to use. And so they're still uh, what we would call live in many cases, as long as they have not been uh, damaged by heat or by ultraviolet or by radiation or something like that. Now, <clears throat> what are the what we'd call the really true sleeping foods? Well, these would be things that you could really wake up and they would become a living food. So what are we talking about? Well, 
one thing we'd be talking about or seeds that could in fact be sprouted uh, the sprouting seeds uh, any of the uh, vegetable seeds that uh, you could uh, germinate and eat them as they are now Now this happens to be wheat in the lower right hand corner down there. We'll throw these them into sprout and go green. These are foods that you could add to things like, well, here's some cooked eggs and some other foods right there. They're obviously dead because they've been heated. But by adding, in this case, lentils, lentils are a wonderful sprout, I've just boosted the nutritional value of those dead foods significantly because I've added these live enzymes and phytonutrients to them. So sleeping foods that can turn into live foods, of course, are very important. And then, of course, we get right to the top of this pinnacle, which is live foods. And these are living, uh, you know, little creatures, if you will. The, the plant itself or the, the seed, uh, the, the fruit that is full of vital nutrients. And one way to look at this is that if you eat things that are alive, they're going to be more life-giving than if you eat something that happens to be dead because life begets life. And there are advantages to having at least 50% of your diet being live, vital foods. Well, you have to have in mind what are you going to do when you can't go to the grocery store and buy the apples and oranges and bananas and cabbage and rutabagas and things or when your garden has, it's now the winter as we are right now, and you're not going to be picking things out of the garden, what can you do? Well, this is where you want to have, in particular, some of these things that you can sprout or other foods that have been processed with low heat so that they still have vital nutrients within them and enzymes. These should be a part of your storage. Some, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the key rules for long-term storage foods is to keep in storage just as much as possible of things that would be sleeping. You might have some things that are alive. I have two wheelbarrow fulls of very lively carrots in my cool garage that I'm saving from our garden. We've got a couple hundred pounds of carrots out there. And I just harvest them periodically. They're live and I have them in the middle of winter. And then we have the other things we're going to call future foods, which we'll be talking about here a little bit too. Some of the favorite sleeping foods that I eat on a regular basis, uh, several times a week, uh, sometimes uh, day after day, and include some of these, and it's under uh, the captain's table raw edge food. In this particular one, there's a cereal, there's a drink mix, and a bar mix. And if you take a look at the ingredients, and this is one of the things I'm always doing when I'm selecting foods that may go into storage, or even foods that I'm eating right now. This is the raw edge nutritional bar ingredients, if you read down the list. There aren't very many things on there that are truly offensive. Uh, and all of the things, all of the seeds, uh, including even the popped amaranth, has been processed with very low heat so that it has not been destroyed uh, by high heat. Freeze-dried flavors, freeze-dried fruit pieces, different things, line foods that are like that, consume them regularly as well as have them in my storage. When properly stored, they can store for a number of years. Just keep rotating them. Here again, there's the nutritional drink. It's not just a sweet drink. It has uh, protein in it. It has fiber in it as well as the good flavors and natural sugars. The cereal, which is very similar to that bar mix you saw the ingredients on, and then the bar mix that you either make into little wafers like that or just eat it crumbly is, works just fine. Uh, another superb convenience food that's good enough to eat daily, and these, by the way, are all being offered through our uh, website. And this is the captain's table. This is a 45-day of quick meals. This includes meals that can be fixed in 10 minutes uh, with either bringing things to a boil and simmering them for a few minutes or just adding boiling water and let it set and then allow things to rehydrate the freeze-dried ingredients and things. It also includes the raw edge. There was a sprouting kit in there, sprouting seeds with a sprouter, uh, and then supplements, the super spectrum supplements that are part of it, so you're getting all of the <clears throat> minerals and other uh, nutrients that you would need. I look at the ingredients as what I do. It's the reason that we've chosen to use these foods is because of the apple, cinnamon, oatmeal, which tastes delicious, by the way. You read the ingredients there, there's nothing offensive whatsoever uh, about those. <clears throat> uh, you take a look at their granola, it's the same kind of things. 
uh, organic, um, non-GMO, uh, very, very uh, nutritious types of things. Even you take a look at a dessert rate in here, Um, the uh, chocolate pudding, which is absolutely delicious, sweetened with the evaporated cane juice. But this is the whole juice, not just the, the, the white sugar, if you will. It has all the minerals and things with it. Uh, the non-fat, dry milk, modified food starch, cream powder, whey powder, cocoa powder, vanilla, natural chocolate flavor, salt. Uh, and then looking at others right here, you can review this video online in the future if you want to read these ingredients. And all of the ingredients will be published to these so you can see them uh, before you buy, buy them. There's also one year of a robust gallery that includes the 10-minute uh, quick meals, whole foods plus raw edge sprouting kit, super spectrum, and all of those things. So these are the kinds of foods that I am looking for and that I would encourage you to look for to put into storage. One of the other things that you may put into storage will be some of these very basic whole foods. And one of the reasons to do this is they're quite economical to purchase in large quantities. Quantity. Uh, we offer some of those, both wheat and beans, and stored away. Do classes in this if you have questions about that. We'll, you'll see those in the future. Store them away in a place where they'll be safe and where you can get at them. And, of course, be using these foods. This is not something you just uh, put in the storage and say, well, when it gets tough, I'll use it. <clears throat> You're actually going through them, using them, learning how to use them, uh, and uh, rotating through these things. One of the things to consider is, you know, we, we know that these whole foods store very, very well. Keep them cool, dark, dry. The whole grains and legumes and things can store for decades. I have, I have some wheat that we put up in 1973 that we're using now. Uh, we keep adding uh, to our supply, but we grind that to make bread out of it. And other whole wheat things we have, uh, any wheat we use, almost 100% of it is whole wheat that we grind, crack, sprout ourselves. But there's something that may be missing on these, and you've got to keep in mind for the uh, make your meals enjoyable. And this is where you want to have spices and herbs and natural flavors and things like that. And I recommend you store plenty of them. Uh, if you buy them right, you buy them in quantity, which we will have in large packages. They can be very, very inexpensive, even for the high-quality ones. You can, of course, grow and harvest your own. And these are a very important trade item uh, in a time of need. If you'll, in fact, you'll remember the spice traders and all the things that went on for, through hundreds of years, spices were so important, both because of their nutritional value and also their health-giving value, but just to add flavor and taste to food. Because I'll tell you what, rice is pretty good, but just plain rice gets real boring in a hurry. But with a little uh, cinnamon added to it and some nuts and raisins to it uh, and a little bit of honey, now you have something that's... Uh, that changes your diet and is delicious. So I described that foods without herbs and spices is kind of like a date without sunshine of salt. And then you can make things like this. You make your own ketchup. You know, a lot of people like to have ketchup. Well, you store ketchup for a little while. Make your own. It has whole ingredients in it, and you can keep producing ketchup. Uh, and uh, and one serious deficiency in a lot of people's storage uh, is the essential oils that we need and having enough oil. Uh, olive oil is one of the best ones that you can store. Now, there's other great oils also, some of the nut oils in particular are wonderful to have. They're kind of expensive, the olive oil being a little more modest in price. And it is, if you, if you buy the right kind, you want extra virgin, uh, first cold press olive oil. It needs to be stored properly. And as I always tell people to extend the life, this is looking down in one of my little freezers. The whole bottom of that chest freezer is nothing but these cans of oil that puts it into suspended animation for long term. And then when the power goes off, I've got a good 10 years after the power goes off to be consuming that oil. You would like to have, on the, the average, we'll say about um, half a gallon per person per month. About six gallons a person a year will take care of you for your nutritional needs 
Uh, and food is much more satisfying with a little bit of oil in it. It is add the uh, provide some of the calories you need. But the right kind of oils, some of the lipids in there are very important for your body. And if you don't have oil, you'll crave it. Uh, you'll be uh, you'll desperately crave oil, as we learn from people after well after many war, uh, wars. World War II was one of them. Uh, it becomes a very important trade item, so have extra is a good idea too. Now, long-term oil storage. Well, you put it in the freezer, that helps, but what are you going to do after it has all been consumed? Uh, what do you do from there? Well, you need things that produce oil. And probably the easiest one for most people will be the sun feed, the, the black sunflower seeds, the oil seeds are the ones that you would want to have. Learn to grow them, practice growing them now, uh, because you can just eat the kernels themselves. That'll give you oil. You can also press the oil out of them if you want it for cooking and some of the other things. So learn to do these things, make them a part of your lifestyle. You learn about things we've been talking about there in a series of classes, class 5105, long-term storage foods for health and strength during disasters. That's the long-term foods. Then you have uh, 5110, which is the basic foods, how to buy them, store them, and use them. Uh, nutrition class 5115, that's beyond the basics, and that's where we're talking about many of the other foods that a lot of people don't have in their diet right now, but you want to put them in, plus considering some of the extremely important herbs and other things to have in your uh, foods. Nutrition class 5215, foods from other cultures for variety and nutrition. You know, when you look around the world, some people have some foods, not only the nutritious, but they'll add an awful lot of, I don't know, spice to your life. And I don't mean spice as in spicy, but they just change it. You may want to consider some of those having them in storage. And some of those other foods store very, very well. Uh, and then getting experience with grid down recipes. When you don't have your utilities and power, how are you going to do some things? What would you do? All right, area number three of these five, food production needs to be something you're practicing right now. Remember the role of nutrition and provident living is to take care of you. You store food and that's a wonderful thing to do, but what are you gonna do when you've consumed all that food or how do you extend its, uh, its life, if you will? How do you extend the quantity that you have? Well, we put it in storage, we store it properly, but over time it's gonna be consumed up and this is where the sleeping foods come in. And this is your future foods. When we take a look at these sleeping foods, we're talking in particular about these seeds. There's three primary ways of using them. One is, which we've already mentioned, that is that you just wake them up and eat them. You germinate them, you sprout them, and there's great advantages to sprouting, and we talk about that in other classes. There's things online you can both read and listen to about sprouting. You should be practicing sprouting weekly, every day. Some people eat sprouts daily, but you need to do that regularly so you're familiar with it. You can, of course, take some of these seeds that you've stored, you plant them, and then you eat the fruit of that seed. And then you can plant and then re-harvest these seeds, the seed saving, so that you can now keep doing this. This is your long-term storage foods comes in. You start with the stored foods that you have. You be sure that you add that, some of the garden seeds, in the gardening classes of Part of Nutrition, we'll talk, uh, teach you how to properly store those seeds so that they will, in fact, survive. And what happens is, as you have all of these seeds, uh, they end up in the garden. You plant the garden, you eat the, the, the produce from them, you enjoy that harvest. You take some of those seeds, you learn how to uh, harvest the seeds properly, prepare them uh, properly. That's through some of the books and classes and things you can learn then those things go back into the garden because at some point in time your stored food and your stored seeds may in fact all be used up but you keep rejuvenating and bringing them back and I hope many of you have been listening to our Tuesday night programs we've done with Carol Depp who is a master at these things we'll have some other people on talking about these and all of those classes will be available online uh, in the future they're being uh, captured and will be ready to go up so here is the end result of some of my own seed saving. This happens to be amaranth, where I gather and then I replant each year. Amaranth going be going up on the upper left hand.
corner, The Resilient Gardener. By the way, you want these other books too. Some of those available to you online in the near future. Listen to what she has to say. Carol is the author of The Resilient Gardener. Uh, learn about composting and more on growing vegetables, natural insect control, and of course the seed saving and harvesting your own seeds to replenish your store of seeds and help other people too. So your future foods may start out looking like this and you repli get them replicating by learning to save those seeds. Uh, and some people say, well, you know, we're just talking about gardening here. There's no big deal about this. Well, what's critical to understand is there's hobby gardening, which most of us have done most of the time. <clears throat> but there's much more to growing food, particularly when you, whether you eat or don't eat depends on it, than just planting some seeds in the dirt and watering them. Because if it's a hobby garden, if things go wrong, no big deal. The store is still there. But what it's really ultimately about is about having a successful and healthy harvest in a time of need. That's why you should be practicing now. So for a, a garden, long-term sustainability is all about you producing foods for your use and for trade. And, and please understand in some of the other community class, when I say community, it's about building community and relationships. It isn't like you have to do everything and grow everything because that's not practical. It's never been done that way. You want to have as broad a picture as you can and find out what, in terms of the skills and things you do, whether it's in gardening or in many other areas, so that you can provide services to other people who are going to provide services and goods to you because no one household can do it all. So as we go through these classes, I know sometimes people go like, I can't do this, there's too much. I can't grow every one of these things. You don't have to is what it comes down to. But you do need to be a part of a community to do that. I'll be doing a class on community in the future here. Uh, you'll really want to listen to that one. Okay, for a successful garden, there's really three primary areas that you have to be paying attention to. And, and if you fail in any one of these areas, the whole process may not work out very well or may totally fail. It's about your relationship to the garden. You are ext you've got to have the right attitude about these things. And um, again, in another class, I talk in greater depth about that. You have to take care of the needs of the garden and then the right tools. So when we talk about you in the midst of these things, well, it is your reason, it is your purpose. It is a work ethic. Gardening is a lot of work, by the way. You do need to have the knowledge, understanding of what to do. That's why you practice now, because you remember from our, our uh, principal courses that knowledge, K equals I times E, K. Knowledge is information multiplied by experience. Read the book, get the information, but you have no, you have no knowledge until you go plant the seeds and grow them and do all the things wrong that you can do until you figure out how to do it right. It is about a commitment, and that's a commitment to that purpose and that uh, reason. It is about patience uh, in the process and being resourceful to come up with answers when things aren't uh, working out right because you have a lot of experience. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. For a successful garden, you have to, of course, be paying attention to the needs of the garden. <coughs> It is about space and location. It's about having a vital soil. It's obviously about having seeds, no seeds, no garden. It's about the nutrients that are in the soil that are gonna end up in the plant. You have to feed the plant so it'll feed you. You've gotta have water and sunlight. All of these have to be taken care of. If you fail at any one of them, you know the whole process is compromised. And then of course you need some of the right tools to take care of things. The proper tools, hand and power driven as appropriate, but other tools that include things like how are you gonna take care of pests, uh, insects and other vermin, and then protection from animal and weather and people. These are all part of the tool area to pay attention to. Again, greater depth in other classes. The fruit of your labor is all about the harvest. And that's where you really get to enjoy this thing is the, the things you pick and utilize fresh and or you can then put into storage either as fresh things like things, potatoes, the squash, and those are vitally important. But you can add in some of these other things, some of them which may be very prolific or very tough. Kohlrabi. I'd never grown kohlrabi until a year ago, and it's actually pretty easy to grow and surprisingly good as a kohlrabi soup. 
There's other very prolific squashes like this little patapan or the oyster squash. Uh, Hopi gray uh, takes a lot of room for that one, but it'll produce, you know, just literally tons of squash off of a few pla plants. So it is about playing with these things and gaining experience with them and you do these things now not later now and you also want to learn some very interesting things that I, I didn't know because I hadn't done some of these things I harvest this cabbage right here had a very nice head of cabbage and then it turns out I ended up with three smaller heads of cabbage off that same plant so now after I harvest a cabbage I don't tear up the plant it wants to go back and do what it was doing before it's likely to produce some more uh, for you uh, you have uh, tomato plants that may look like that, the way that, uh, you know, you grow them. And I had this really clever idea two years ago about what I wanted to do, and it was going to be easier, and I was going to have wonderful tomatoes. Eh. Oh, man, was that a disaster. That lower left-hand corner there, that poor scraggly little tomato plant. And it did go to fruit. You know, they're amazing. They, they really want to do their job, which I so learned not to do what I thought I was going to do there. I thought I was being clever. Also, you learn about some of the pests you may have in the area. In this case, the areas uh, are... Uh, uh, four uh, primary groupings of squash that if you um, plant the ones in the same group in there, they cross uh, contaminate, cross pollinate, and you don't end up with a true seed. So you've got to learn about those things and practice with it. And the soil is one of the things that you want to learn to be working with because it's really about learning to build and sustain the vitality of soil because it's not just dirt. It has minerals and microorganisms and fungi and water and gases and things. In fact, you take a look at my my base soil that I'm working with in our house where we live. This is very pale soil. Uh, it grows weeds pretty well, but nothing else uh, you know, is produced very well. My garden soil looks like that now on the right because this is what I'm adding to it on the left over there. And building that soil, you start doing those things now, uh, and you learn how to keep doing them so that that uh, garden will be vital as you need it. Also, learning to work with animals. This may be appropriate for a lot of people, and you need that practice now. We're talking about uh, chickens, rabbits, ducks, goats, the very small uh, farm animals would be the one that most people can work with. And uh, most, uh, I'll say, semi-rural um, areas um, where you have uh, some of the urban areas uh, that with a little more space in them, a lot of times you can have chickens there. Sometimes they don't like roosters because they're noisy. But you may want to be experimenting with chickens or move to an area where you can and then consider the ducks and the rabbits and goats, but you need to be learning about them now. So nutrition class 50, 50. permanent long-term future foods. 5151, who's um, Fred Bowman, which is just a lot of fun to listen to, and also Carol Depp doing some of these other classes. Uh, 52, 52, grid down garden insect and vermin control. There's an important one. If we're using all the sprays and things right now, what are you going to do when you can't get to practice now? Uh, 5153, recover, reuse, replenish, rejuvenate. This is all about building the soil so that the garden will give back. 5160, the basics of getting started with animals for food. And 5260, the essentials of small, ca uh, small scale poultry flock. If you listen to Carol Depp that we had, I believe uh, last week, not this week, it was a rerun, but last week, talking about the the flock in her case she uses ducks because they work very well in the maritime northwest where she is uh, you, you want to consider that and in her book the resilient gardener she talks about the importance of that extending the harvest is another thing you may want to do particularly if you live in some of the colder areas like i do we have a fairly short growing season so adding in the greenhouse the sun space <clears throat> whether they be large or small 
and how to extend that season and how to begin earlier because you're protecting those plants. Uh, my uh, beets that I was harvesting in 2006 uh, or 2005, I guess in December is when this is. So the shelter class, 6250. Practical options for heating with solar energy, shelter class 6350. The low cost do-it-yourself greenhouse that we did a little while back, shelter class 6351, the best greenhouse designs for extending the growing season. In some cases, you may be able to grow year-round. Uh, that may be an important thing for you to consider doing. So you want to be learning about them now, practicing now. Number four of these five areas for nutritional self-reliance, that is preserving food, and you're enjoying doing that now and having fun with it. Uh, there is something satisfying about taking foods and preserving them now for your future use. <clears throat> and in this case, we would in particular be talking about these foods that you grow in the future that you'll be saying, saving and uh, preserving for the future, such as winter, things that uh, people used to do all the time. There's uh, wonderful books on these topics that you can be learning about in the library class. I'll give you greater depth and reviews on them, but you can learn a variety of methods and practice them now, including even you know certain things you just leave in the ground such as these beets that I dug in uh, March, I think is when I got them out, or April, I was digging these beets. Uh, you may want to practice things like taking a bucket of green beans and reducing it to dry, dry green beans. That bucket shrinks down to that uh, one cup size right there. Uh, gets the volume down so you can And pack more beans in a small area. Drying some of the squash, uh, even a cucumber uh, can be dry. Now in most cases right now with utilities you can do that with electricity but you want to have backup means when the power isn't there that you can keep doing that making your root leathers. Canning of course is another way. That bowl of beets will go into all of those pint jars right there or it shrinks down into that one jar when you dry them. <clears throat> Nutrition class 5170, tools, techniques, and supplies for food preservation at home. 5270, uh, save the harvest fresh with or without the grid. And as I mentioned to you, I've got uh, probably 100 and maybe it's 150 pounds of carrots right now and two full wheelbarrows. And we've been eating on those things uh, for months now and we'll have them right through the winter. Uh, and there's other techniques you can use too. Nutrition class 571, preserving foods while you still have utilities, nice to practice them now, what to do when, with foods when the grid goes away. There you have a freezer full of stuff and a refrigerator full of things. Something ugly has happened and you know that power grid's not coming back for days, weeks, months, years. What are you going to do? That's class 5371. Nutrition class 5372. preserving milk without refrigeration, uh, 50 more, yet it works very well. Uh, this area number five for nutritional self-reliance, and this is gathering of wild foods, and you practice doing those things now. And this is not just, oh, I'm lost in the woods, I have to learn how to do this. This is something you do now because there's great nutrition in many of these plants. Some of them like this plant down in the lower right-hand corners, the, uh, the lamb's quarter there, you think of it as a weed. Well, it's going to grow. And it grows every year very well. It's extremely nutritious. You should be harvesting. Don't pull it and throw it away. Yeah, eat the weed. You have other things like the dandelion that uh, is very nutritious. And the thing that I, I didn't know until recently while I was doing some of the studying on this, dandelion is not native to America. Yes, and I know it goes coast to coast and it's all over the place. It was imported uh, by the colonists when they came to this country. It was imported from Europe because they used dandelion all the time. It's an herb. It's a food. It has great nutritional value. They showed up in the Americas and lo and behold, there were no dandelions. They missed them. They needed them. They wanted them. So they imported them. Uh, don't spray them and kill them. Uh, eat them. The root, the blossom, and of course the leaf. <clears throat> there are other things that you need to learn about. And in most cases, we look at them as weeds and pests and people are trying to kill them and spray them. Don't do that. They're going to show up. They're wild. They're adapted. They're tough. They're very nutritious. They're very healthy. Uh, nutrition class 5180, 
wild harvest for nutrition, health, and sustainability. It's an important part of your sustainability. That's why the colonists brought the the uh, dandelions of this country because it helps sustain them. It's the first thing up in the spring. It is rich in nutrients. It is a bitter herb. Bitter herbs can be very nutritious, and so that's why they brought it, helps sustain them. Uh, and then class 5401, which is experiences with wild harvest in the field. You need to be playing with that, learning about those things. The role of nutrition again and again is this food security which is a vehicle to assure that we are nourished in times of need. Well, lack of food in the stores will not be a threat to you if you have learned to live and you're regularly practicing these five areas we've been talking about. The principles of nutrition now, uh, storing health giving zero class people. Well, will you live providently is always the question. The choice is yours, whether we're talking gardening or water or sanitation or any of them. It's by making proper provisions in all areas of your life that you can face the future, not with fear and trepidation, but with hope, with confidence, with the ability to say, I can do this, and by the way, I can help other people around me. Should we have things go very, very poorly, whether it's natural made, economic made, uh, man made, uh, whatever causes these things, if there's a breakdown, and they have happened in the past, we've gone through these periods throughout the history of mankind, just look at the history. Sometimes we have a tendency to say, oh, we're too sophisticated and smart and we have all these wonderful tools and computers and communication, can't happen to us. Reality is we're more vulnerable because of our dependence on all these things. The truth about life is this, there's no doubt that tomorrow will come and there's no dispute that things happen. How you're prepared to meet tomorrow will make all the difference in the world. If you're prepared for the worst, then no matter what happens, it will be an adventure. And remember, it's what's inside of your head, your heart, what's at your fingertips, not just what you would store. So as always, I encourage people to try and test and play, gain experience, do weird things. I do weird things. <clears throat> I encourage you to do the strange things. We will always be here. I will do my best to be here every single Wednesday or somebody will be here to share information with you. Uh, and then our Tuesday night programs that we have, interview other guests. The uh, Q&A for tonight, if you have any questions on this class, which is uh, um, this uh, overview class, this beginning class of Nutrition 5001. If the power goes out and I have to dry the steaks and roast in my freezer, uh, do you have a book you can recommend on drying meats and at different temperatures? Well, if the power is out, uh, then you're going to be reliant upon primarily upon the sun and or fire to do things. There are a number of traditional methods you'll want to learn about. Um, and yeah, one of the books, I can't remember the name of it right now, uh, there it is right there, uh, Preserving Foods Without Freezing or Canning is the book. Uh, there aren't a lot of books on this topic that I've found. There's a lot of things in magazines and online that you can look up. Yeah, here's one to consider if you want to make a food uh, dryer. Um, you know, having panes of glass and a semi-insulated uh, container will allow the heat to get up during cooled areas. That's called your car that you can no longer drive because there's no fuel to run it or you have uh, uh, an EMP or something has taken out the electronics and it won't run. Uh, I like having my vehicles that have manual windows I can roll up and down because I can then put drying racks inside on the seats, crack the windows, let the sun shine in and work on controlling the heat so it's not too high and I want it to be high enough to kill things off. Smoking is another way of doing it, smoking them over a fire in cooler areas. So there are things that you can do, but you need to be prepared ahead of time. Because the question is, if the power is going to go out and I have all the stuff in the freezer, what do I do? Well, you cook some of it uh, right away. It'll store a little longer if you cook it. And then you start drying those things. You can also bottle it if you have the means of uh, heating things in a canner with um, um, you know, propane. Uh, so I have the auxiliary stoves and those kinds of things. If I need to, I'll start canning and bottling things and putting away so, so that I don't lose them. Uh, you may want to consider 
um, minimizing the amount of foods that can spoil when the freezer goes off. One of the main reasons that I have a freezer, I have two of them, the entire bottoms of those freezers are all lined with uh, oil type of things. Cans of olive oil as you saw, but I also have nuts and other things that will go rancid. I store some of them in there and also the garden seeds when they've been properly dried, you freeze them and that will extend their life. It pretty much puts them in suspended animation. That's what the freezer is for. Yes, there is some meat and some other things that you'd be using, but don't have your entire store of food in a freezer because when the power goes out, you got to work fast. Um, let's see, I've heard that uh, vegetable shortening stores indefinitely without refrigeration. Well, um, yes, uh, vegetable shortening uh, will store for long periods of time. It's not indefinite. It will eventually get a, an off smell. Once it's been opened, it's oxygen that's a problem. Now, if you'll take your vegetable shortening and put it into the freezer, uh, that extends the life. A refrigerator will help also. I prefer to use the oils because they are healthier. Olive oil or some of the nut oils, the safflower oil, uh, flax oil and some of those, they're uh, very healthy. Uh, they're better for you than the uh, hydrogenated vegetable shortening, which makes it go solid. You'd rather have the liquids. Um, so I, uh, and I do have a little bit of vegetable shortening, but not very much. Uh, most all of what we have in storage is the, uh, the oils that are in the bottom of the freezer so that they uh, essentially, when the power goes off, I've got at least 10 years to use them up as long as I don't put them out and get them really hot. Uh, also, and we'll talk in depth I'm on uh, olive oils and some of those in the other classes and the best ways to store them. This is a lot of fun, by the way. Uh, please don't look at this as saying this is too much. I have a lot of fun experimenting with these things. I've been doing a lot of Dutch oven cooking lately out in my garage uh, with the propane stove uh, that I, I have. Uh, and what I've determined, boy, is it, when you use a Dutch oven on a propane stove, uh, it doesn't take very much pro uh, propane to cook with. It's very, very economical. I'm going to be building a uh, insulated hood that goes over it, get it down to where you're just using tiny little bits of fuel so I can extend that storage. And that's one of the reasons I experiment with things. I want to know how to make my propane and my other fuels go a long time. Do you use a frostless freezer? No, I don't. I use a chest freezer. Um, the uprights, you can get upright freezers that are the frostless. They consume a lot more energy, but the challenge, uh, and as far as I know, there are no frostless chest freezers. I don't believe they make them that way but just because of how the mechanisms and those work. So for energy savings, I use a chest freezer. But the other reason I use a chest freezer is once the power goes off, it's going to hold the cold, if you will, much better because every time you open the door on an upright is all the cold air, which is more dense than the room air, comes spilling out on the floor and you dump a bunch of warm air into the freezer or now the, the frozen foods and things are going to have to chill down that air, which means you're warming things up. A chest freezer holds, the, uh, holds out the heat far better than an upright does, so I use chest freezers only because they consume less power to start with, and secondly, they will hold their cold longer uh, when the power goes out. So that's the reason I use what I use rather than the frostless. Now, by the way, this is how I defrost my chest freezers. Um, I finally defrosted the big one uh, that we moved to the house where we're in right now. We've been in the house seven and a half years. And the way that I defrost it is you just take the, uh, you, you think of defrosting it, take everything out and put it in coolers and throw dry ice on it and let the, everything melt in there and get a hair dryer and drain it out. Don't do that. It's real simple. What you do is you take all the frozen food out, put it in a couple of cardboard boxes, and take your ice scraper for your window and go in there and chip the ice out. Now, I have a wet vacuum so that the crumbs that are in the bottom, I scoop them out, and I can just take them and sweep them up. I didn't even turn the freezer off. I set the foods outside. It took us 10 minutes to do that. Everything goes back inside. Now, the thing that you would like to do that will allow that ice to come off even more easily is that spray the inside down with a silicon spray, something that just has silicon in it. Spray down the inside of that freezer with that. Then the ice will not adhere to it very well, and you just knock it out very easily. So as a matter of fact, the way that I was defrosting this is I have a big uh, wet vacuum, um, and it has uh, you know one of the crevice tools on it. I was actually using that as my ice scraper in most cases just running it along it was chipping the ice and such of ice and frost 
right into that wet vacuum immediately. So that's how I defrost my freezers is I just I defrost my windows in the morning, go out there with an ice scraper. Any other questions anybody has <clears throat> that you'd like to share? Um, and I, again, I encourage you to be, just be playing with these things, test, try, experiment. That's why I'm doing all of my Dutch oven cooking and uh, cast iron cookware cooking. Um, they don't work real well on one of these stoves that has the glass top on it, but uh, one of the, um, uh, the propane stoves uh, that runs on the bottles, um, the Camp Chef, I have a couple of those. And I'm just doing a whole bunch of cooking on it, experimenting with it, learning how to be extremely miserly with the propane that I have. Uh, Dutch ovens do a great job on those things. Have yourself a great evening. This is Jim Phillips with Safe Harbor.